Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hi, wow, so good to see you all again. Um, so last time, again, we covered Multego, uh, and we were covering network fingerprinting, and we had a little bit of issues running Multego because all of you are using different computers, you're using different operating systems, and sometimes it can be a little bit confusing to get those tools working correctly. So we're gonna go back and learn some more about Multego next time, but I wanted to take a little bit of a break from that and let you guys uh, kind of look at some other ways that you can run tools like a Multego if you're having issues running it in your own operating system. Now, since we're learning about ethical hacking, one of the things I tell people is you should probably have a separate computer to do this sort of thing on eventually. Um, there are some things you're just not going to want to run on your system. There's some things you might not want to download on your system, especially if it has a bunch of personal information, files, other things that might be downloaded or stolen or infected with ransomware. If you care about that stuff, then eventually you're going to want to separate the system that you're using so you're not doing your math homework and like trying out some new hacking tool on the same system. So Kali Linux is usually the first operating system that beginning hackers learn. The reason being that it's a Debian-based system. It's very reliable, it's very stable, it's open source, and it's specifically meant for people who are interested in this sort of thing because it includes basically all the libraries that you need in order to get started. So just going over what is Linux, uh, Linux is an, an alternative operating system from Windows or Mac. It's been along for, around for a long time. And when we talk about Linux, we're actually just talking about a kernel. So the kernel is what manages the interaction between the hardware and the applications needing access to system resources. So Linux just kind of sits in the middle of that conversation and translates the request for system resources into actual allocation. So it is open source, and generally, if you have a device that is smart, like an Internet of Things device, a printer, a router, a, a webcam, a web server, a lot of these things are going to run Linux. So the reason for that is it's free to run. Uh, it's open source. Anybody can use it. Uh, you can develop off of it. But that actually means that there's a lot of fragmentation in Linux. So when we just say Linux, what's very confusing to beginners is they're like, all right, let me download Linux. And then they try, and they very quickly realize there's Arch Linux, there's Debian Linux, there's Ubuntu, there's Fedora, there's Red Hat. There's like all these different versions of Linux because um, people have specialized it. They've built things on it, and it's really like branched out. So as you can see on the slide here, it's branched out a lot. This is just Debian. If you were to look at the entire um, part of Linux and like the kind of family tree, it's much bigger, it includes much more detail, and there are much more branches. But Debian is the branch of Linux that uh, Kali Linux is based off of, and it's generally one of the more accepted like um, kind of like baseline Linux distributions to use just to throw on a computer or something. So while Ubuntu is very popular for beginners, Debian is the starting point for a lot of different projects just because it's updated fairly frequently. It's, again, very reliable, and a lot of people use it. So there's a tremendous amount of support available. So if you look at this family tree, you can see that Debian splits off in tons of more specific distributions. And the one we're going to be talking about today, Kali Linux, actually used to be called Backtrack Linux and then has been updated uh, throughout the years to now be Kali. So um, another thing to understand is that uh, when we're specifically choosing a Debian or a, any sort of distribution of Linux, we're talking about a specific operating system for the computer now, not just a, a kernel. A distribution is a whole collection of programs that allow you to run an operating system, kind of simulate what you are used to on your usual computer, your, your Windows or your Mac OS computer. So it runs basic programs and utilities that allow your computer to run. And it also is more than just a pure operating system. Debian comes with over 51,000 uh, packages and other things pre-compiled to basically look like and run like a general desktop operating system. It's not going to be intimidating for beginners. It's not going to be hard for people to learn because there's a lot already pre-installed and set up. So some Linux distributions are very bare bones. And if you download the wrong one, like uh, Arch Linux, you're just going to get like a command line prompt. Uh, or like you'll have to right mouse click on something because there's no icons or menus. So that can be really confusing for beginners. And that's why we recommend Debian as kind of a starting point. So within Debian, getting more specific, there's a type of uh, Linux distribution called Kali Linux. And Kali Linux is Debian that's been specially modified for the purpose of hosting various security tools. So if you're looking to learn some of the most relevant, modern, interesting, like bleeding edge security tools, Kali is what you want to get because it's often the first operating system that will be supported when somebody comes out with a new tool. That being said, it also plays very well with uh, Python scripts and things like that. So it's a really good platform for being able to uh, run uh, exploits or t test out new packages and generally like get started with uh, things already kind of set up in a way where you won't need to 
just break your back installing all these tools. Now you can technically do a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about with like Ubuntu, but it would be really annoying to install all the dependencies and get everything up and running. So that's why we recommend uh, the specialized version of Debian because it's stable, it's well, it's well maintained, and most importantly, it has a ton of support. So if you are a beginner, you are going to run into problems. I cannot help you with all of them because that is the nature of Linux to learn how to solve problems. You will get errors and alerts and things that aren't installed and you'll need to Google them in order to find out. Now, if there are no responses or no answers to your Google search, it's really hard to do this. But because so many people use Kali Linux and so many people will probably have been trying to do the exact same thing you're doing, if you filter your search results right, so you omit anything that's outside of about a year's range, because that's all garbage and doesn't work the same now, so it has to be within a year, you will find the answer to your questions on Stack Overflow or some other like technical thing just by searching for the right keywords. So that's important. If you decide to use some random distribution that doesn't have good support, as a beginner, you can get stuck very easily and have no answer to a very basic problem that somebody else might have already solved. So never underestimate estimate the power of having a good community behind a distribution that you're using the more popular it is you know you might think like I want to be cool and I want to use like a really obscure operating system great do it when you know how to fix problems on it because if you don't as a beginner it will be very frustrating for you to try to use these systems when you don't get answers from the community um, so it's maintained by offensive security uh, at Kali.org um, and it can do all kinds of things that are very difficult to do on like a Windows or a Mac computer and the reason for that is it has very low level access to all the hardware and I mean you can just tell it to destroy itself and it will. That's the difference between kind of a consumer computer and a computer that's running on Linux. It will listen to you and it will do exactly what you say, literally. Uh, it will not guess that you don't know what you're talking about and you don't really mean it. It might maybe display a warning prompt on some of the more dangerous commands, but you, you can just go right through it. So that means you can toast your operating system really easily, um, which uh, is different. Uh, if you're used to being warned a thousand times and kind of babied by your operating system, this is much more real. Um, so you need to pay attention to what you're doing and not reformat the wrong drive or something like that, because it will just go ahead and do it. Uh, but that's also the power with uh, Linux. You're able to get the computer to do things that you can't get it to do in a normal operating system anywhere near as easily or sometimes at all. So there are more operating systems or distros besides Kali Linux that uh, hackers like to use. I want to give you guys some options because not everybody you know, enjoys the same system. And as you grow more experience, there are other distributions that actually are arguably better and you might actually enjoy more. So Black Arch Linux is a, a type of Arch Linux, which is a much more lightweight system that can run on systems that maybe are too slow or too old to run um, something that requires more resources. Or maybe you're saving those resources for some other uh, you know, uh, process and you can't spare them. Black Arch Linux is a very bare bones, very, very well armed uh, Linux distribution that has tons and tons and tons of uh, hacking and security tools, but an incredibly lightweight and simple um, kind of a graphic user interface for the desktop. That means that when you're using Arch Linux, anybody sitting behind you in a coffee shop is going to know some shit's up and they're going to be like, what are you doing? Because it does not look like a normal like operating system. It looks like you're up to some hacker stuff. So be aware, like this one's more, like, uh, this is less like the standard operating system you're used to dealing with and much more like pure Linux. So I highly recommend you guys check it out um, if you want to download it and run it in one of the ways I'll go over. It's a super interesting system and it does have some tools that Kali Linux doesn't have. Uh, so it's also updated very often and uh, again, it can be off-putting for beginners. My personal favorite is Parrot Security OS. Now I haven't mentioned it because our kind of final um, suggestion is Kali Linux on a Raspberry Pi and unfortunately um, Parrot Security OS doesn't have great support on the Raspberry Pi right now. It's kind of complicated to install. But if you're running it as a virtual machine on your computer, you're installing it uh, as a dual boot on your computer, or you're installing it on an old laptop, Parrot Security OS will actually make you stop using like Windows or Mac sometimes because it is so convenient and, and works more like a, a traditional desktop that even though it has all these great hacking tools, so much thought and detail has been put into making it a good user experience that you can generally do most of the stuff that you would want to do, uh, including like some gaming and stuff like that on this version of Linux while still doing hacking stuff. Again, that gets into the problem where like, if you start using it like your desktop computer, you can start to mix things and end up with a situation where you have a bunch of stuff you really care about on this computer. So be careful with that because it is really tempting to start using Parrot Security OS as just a regular kind of daily um, OS. So it does have less support than Kali Linux. And that means while it does have some unique hacking tools that aren't included in Kali, you might run into some problems that haven't been properly documented or answered. So you can get stuck on some of the things that you might try to do. It's maintained uh, at parrotsec.org. 
It has a package manager as well that makes installing some tools way easier than like a doing a git clone and then going through all the things. It'll actually parse all the requirements, get install them for you, and make it a very simple kind of GUI focused process for installing all kinds of new stuff. So um, it also has a focus on anonymous surfing. So if you're interested or curious about that and you want to use it as your primary operating system, maybe you don't even want to run a bunch of hacking tools and you just want like a cool customizable system that allows you to very quickly turn on and off anonymous surfing. They have excellent um, options for VPNs, for just going over Tor and doing all kinds of like stuff to make it difficult to tell who's doing what you're doing. So because it's focused on anonymity, some people actually use it for that as well. So what are your options for actually running these distributions? I went over three. You can actually install any of these things. And the first one that's the most easy, if you don't want to buy a new computer, you don't want to create a new partition, is to run it on a virtual machine. Now, virtual machines are simple. You can use a program like VirtualBox to take one of the, these images, and it will basically run it within your computer uh, to share system actual hardware resources so that two different computer systems can be running at the same time on the same device. So uh, inception. Uh, so there are some problems with a virtual machine, but the most uh, useful thing is it is very, very convenient and you can run it immediately on whatever computer you're using if you just want to you know, kind of try something. So uh, these environments are isolated, isolated from each other. Uh, however, they are on the same physical machine, sharing the same uh, processor and the same memory. So um, the, in virtual machines, the host is the operating system that is already on your computer, and the guest is the operating system, in this case, Kali Linux, or one of the other ones that we're trying to use. And you can actually run it just kind of like another window on your Windows or um, Mac OS computer, where you just have one window open that is an entirely different operating system. Now that's heavy on system resources, sometimes, uh, depending on the distro and depending on your computer. So if you're running a virtual machine, it can really make things slow down, um, because you are sharing your processing power. So if you start doing something very intense in Kali Linux, it can make your overall system shut, uh, slow down. So I hate virtual machines. Um, they're convenient, and nobody wants to buy a new computer, but there are constantly hardware errors. We tried to teach a class on Wi-Fi hacking, Evelyn was there, uh, where we got everybody together and we were gonna like start working on these things and nobody could get the virtual machine running. We had people that had to go into their BIOS in their like hardware settings and enable like functions um, within the hardware to do virtualization. We had other issues where we fixed all that, we could get it running, and then for some reason it wouldn't be able to read the network adapter card. So we were trying to teach about Wi-Fi hacking. We couldn't even get them to scan. Um, and then the last thing is software issues, uh, where drivers won't work, like certain other things won't function. And because a lot of these errors are so specific to the hardware that you're running th this on, it makes it really annoying because there's so many factors. For example, you need to know what the guest system is, what the host system is, what the hardware it's running on is. So if you're looking to find someone who has the exact same problem as you, virtualization makes it that much harder. Because we're talking about hardware sharing, we're talking about software sharing, it's, it's just annoying, or it can be annoying. Not always, and as you get more experience, you'll learn to work with virtual machines in a, in a more versatile way. But for now, as a beginner, they're going to be something that causes, sometimes can cause a lot of frustration, even though they're very easy to get started with. Now, if you're not using things like uh, network adapters or other hardware peripherals, a virtual machine is actually a perfectly good way to get started. If you're running Python tools, if you're doing search, like all that stuff, you can totally do that in a, a virtual machine. But the second you start trying to interface with outside hardware or uh, do stuff like that, your computer gets confused sometimes between do I send this hardware to the virtual machine or do I send it to the real machine? Like, Things like that can cause issues that make it really frustrating. So if you're having those sorts of issues, consider trying a different way of installing one of these operating systems. So another way, uh, which I like much better, and is kind of the gateway drug to actually just running a Linux computer, is to create a partition on your hard drive that's empty and just run it there. So what you'll do is uh, you'll create a blank partition, reboot your computer, and hold down whichever key allows you to boot from a, a USB drive. Sometimes you'll have to go into your BIOS and enable that setting to tell it to boot from the USB drive first. But if you put Kali Linux on the USB drive in a, a bootable um, image, you plug it in, and then you boot from that, it'll give you the option to install it directly on the empty partition you created. So what that translates to is you'll be able to turn on your computer, select if you want to run Windows or Kali, and then boot whichever you want. 
Now, it's not as convenient as a virtual machine because you'll still have to turn off your computer and turn it back on in order to boot into a different one. But since they're separated and they're not sharing system resources, you eliminate most of the problems when it comes to like hardware issues. And you also will tend to find yourself like kind of sticking to one or another. So you'll start learning Linux more because it's available on your system. And just by switching back and forth, it kind of forces you to learn Linux a little bit more. I find it has a positive effect on people who are learning because you'll just learn to do stuff because it's a little bit inconvenient to restart. So you'll start like getting more familiar with Linux because it kind of, it kind of forces you to. Um, so once it's installed on the partition, that'll give us the ability to boot back and forth between them whenever we want to. And that can give us a, uh, a lot of relief from hardware errors, issues from virtualization, uh, running network adapters. We can destroy the partition if necessary, which means if we ever get a virus on it or you know, we just need to get rid of it quickly, we can just overwrite the partition and it's not going to, going to affect um, any of our other data, hopefully. Now keep in mind, these partitions exist on the same hard drive. So if you were to, to get some particularly nasty malware, there's really nothing from stopping it, uh, stopping it from spreading to another partition. So you should still be careful and realize that you know, this is on the same hard computer still. It's better than having to go buy another computer, but it's still not quite as good as separating it completely. So the last way you can do this is running Linux as the primary operating system just on hardware. So what that means is either you'll have your own computer, a desktop, a, a laptop, something like that, that you'll put Linux on and have no other operating system. It just boots straight into that. So you can run Kali on older computers, you can run it on desktop computers, and you can even run it on single board cheap computers like this right here. So this is one of my favorites. This is the Raspberry Pi 3, and the new version just came out. This is the Pi um, 3B+. These come with onboard Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, they have uh, Ethernet adapters, uh, USB ports, HDMI ports, audio ports. Uh, just all this stuff is included on a very, very cheap, simple board. So by taking Kali Linux and simply putting a bootable version on this tiny SD card, you can insert it and then have your entire hacking computer just be this. Now, why is that useful? Uh, it's a very, Kali is a very lightweight distribution, so it can run on this very easily. If you look at this computer on the screen, we have it running on a one inch by one inch, uh, by like three inch Raspberry Pi 3B plus, and you cannot even see the computer. It's smaller than the keyboard. So you can run an attack computer on basically like this little, little tiny board that I've hidden in a pair of headphones, which means you could be on your phone controlling this Kali Linux attack computer, attacking networks, doing all sorts of nefarious stuff, and the only outward sign would be that you're on your phone and you're wearing headphones. So you can start to get really sneaky with the form factors you put this stuff on, because you can put a full-on attack operating system that has all the tools that Kali has to offer. Now, is it practical to run like, a, like a, a, an attack that basically takes all the network traffic and routes it through the little, tiny, one-inch Raspberry Pi? No. It's the, cheapest version of the Raspberry Pi, it's $10. It's also not a powerful enough computer to really trick people unless you're only targeting like specific sites, not doing like all the traffic on the entire network. It would slow things down too much. But using the small form factor, you can still do a lot of the same things that you would want to do just considering the system resources and what and whether what you're trying to do is like too intensive for that particular form factor. So the Raspberry Pi is a cute, scary cyber weapon. Uh, the reason why is because you can plug whatever you want into it and control it pretty much directly. In this case, in the example on the screen, I have a network adapter plugged into it, which would give me um, the ability to basically just dominate any wireless network that I'm close to, because I can make my network appear to be stronger. I can shut down their network so that it doesn't work. Uh, and I can also plug in other things like GPS units or other sorts of sensors to either be able to add a camera module for a spy camera, add a passive infrared sensor so I can detect when people are in the room. I can add a microphone so I can record when I detect a particular MAC address nearby so that I only record when I know that someone with a certain cell phone is in the room. You can really use this, and depending on how you think as a programmer and the different hardware pieces you install, you can rapidly prototype devices that run based on tools using Kali Linux and either as a beginner learn to use those tools or as a developer take the next step in making them more useful for whatever your use case is. Now the reason why the, the Pi is a good uh, solid choice for a hardware device is the amount of support. So, so many people have run Kali Linux on a Raspberry Pi that most of the problems you're ever going to encounter have already been located, identified, and solved. So, a quick Google search, uh, just like doing it for Kali Linux versus like, uh, you know, Arch Linux or one of the more advanced distributions, will almost always find you the, you know, the problem and the solution for what you're curious about. 
So originally the Raspberry Pi was made for teaching children about coding. They wanted to create a very low cost, easy computer uh, that they could give to people in schools and kids could learn to program in Python, turn on a light switch and basically plug this thing in and do anything from create a drone to create a web server. Um, these things are also really popular with researchers because you can leave them remotely and have them run off of a, a solar panel or a battery and they'll run for a very, very long time. So they're very versatile, and in their third generation now, they're actually powerful enough that they have communications uh, built in, so they have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So if you add a network adapter, it's actually a complete uh, electronics weapons module. You have a command and control adapter, so you can communicate with it, and then you have an attack interface that's able to affect the area and, and do all kinds of nefarious stuff, if that's what you're into. So there's a $5 version, which is the Raspberry Pi Zero, which does not include Wi-Fi, but it will still run Kali Linux. You'll have to plug an adapter into it, but it will still work. And then there's a $45 version, which is the very newest, not that one, the very newest uh, Raspberry Pi uh, 3B Plus. Comes with a faster processor, faster Ethernet, um, um, just generally like better. Um, but if you're worried about cost, you can just pick up a whole bunch of Raspberry Pi uh, Zeros, and provided you're not looking to do anything too processor intensive, intensive, it will run Kali Linux. So the benefit of this is also that it is not your everyday computer. If you had to break this stupid little thing in half and throw it into a lake because you did something really bad, not that you ever would, then you would not be very sad about that. But if it was your nice gaming laptop because you downloaded something you shouldn't have and now you got to get rid of it, it's it would be a painful experience because you have, you know, it's your hardware, it's your software, it has all of your stuff on it. This doesn't have anything you care about and it never should. So because it's such a small, easy to replace device, you really don't need to care about leaving this behind or breaking it or whatever. You can feel free to experiment and start prototyping things or start throwing things around because this is adult Legos. This is hacking Legos. You plug stuff in and generally it will just work. So you can also go on Amazon and see the kind of stuff you can plug into this and really get creative with the kinds of devices you could implement based on things you notice about the kinds of systems you're trying to attack. So how does this work? It's really easy. Um, there's a program called Etcher, which will just basically write the image file for the operating system directly to this little SD card. So you'll take the ISO file um, from the Kali Linux website or whichever, wherever you choose to download it. You will use Etcher to burn it to a micro SD card and then you'll pop that sucker in here plug it in, and that's it. On the bottom, uh, in here you see an example where I have a Raspberry Pi uh, Model 3 plugged into a projector, um, and then I have a little keyboard. So it's cool because I just made it take up the entire room based on a tiny, tiny little computer like this, and I can be just surrounded by Kali Linux uh, in a matter of minutes. Um, just because it's easy to burn these SD cards, it's easy to just plug it in and set it up, and since most of the things are already pre-installed, you can get started very quickly. So with some configuration, um, you can also set it up to be accessible from your, from your laptop and cell phone. Now what this means is the kind of final kit of this is you have Kali Linux running on a Raspberry Pi, which again has its own Wi-Fi card. That Wi-Fi card can connect to your phone's hotspot and make it so you can log into your Pi from your phone or your computer if you connect it all via the hotspot. And you can control this very innocently from just being on your phone, scrolling, tapping, either through VNC, which allows you to access the, the desktop and actually see the full desktop as though you were inside just sitting in behind the GUI, or command line. So you can still use most of the tools that are available, but you don't get to see uh, you know, all the pretty stuff on the desktop, and you also won't be able to open multiple windows. So there's an even more specific flavor of Kali Linux called, that's developed by a security researcher who goes by Reason. Um, I used to follow him when I wrote for uh, various articles, and his specific version of, Raspberry, of the Raspberry Pi-based kernel is really, really interesting because it's customized specifically for the Pi, and it has uh, a number of things that are very useful for beginners that will save you a lot of time in setting things up. So it's also currently the only version of Kali Linux that works on the new Raspberry Pi 3B+. The, the offensive security uh, group hasn't gotten around to releasing one. So uh, the beginner modules plus the fact that it runs on the newest Pi will save you a lot of time. It does run a little bit hot though, so we'll see about that um, on some things. So uh, it supports more advanced uses, like it has a specialized display for mounting it to a drone. Uh, and then it also, he also has a deliberately vulnerable Raspberry Pi image you can swap out so that if you have an extra Pi and you want to attack it, you can have an image that is deliberately vulnerable, has all the things that you would want to be practicing on, and guess what? It's not someone else's stuff, so you're not going to get in trouble. So the Pi is also cool because this same device, if I take this card out and put a different card in, is now suddenly a completely different computer. 
now it's a vulnerable computer that I can attack with my other Pi or my computer, my, you know, my normal laptop and not feel bad about destroying the, compu the computer I'm attacking because it's specifically meant for that. So being able to practice is something that's very important. As you guys learn these skills, like you'll want to try them out. And if you don't have a good place to do that, it's very tempting to just do it on someone else's. Sometimes that's the only target that's available. So the point of the Raspberry Pi is also the fact that you can boot another operating system that will help you learn about it so that you're not either attacking your own computer or someone else's you don't have permission to. So this is a, an example of one of the applications. You can mount the Raspberry Pi with Kali Linux onto a drone, and it becomes an a weapon, electronic weapons module. So that means it's good for uh, jamming, it's good for infiltrating, it's good for tracking. Uh, it can do all sorts of stuff from the air. And it's basically a payload that you can configure to just land and start attacking anywhere. That starts to get into much more advanced applications of this. But if you think of this as a weapons platform that you can communicate with remotely, either from your phone or you know, if it were in a drone, this gives you the ability to reach out and touch things uh, with a very advanced tool set in your hands that has We'll get into the kinds of tools that Kali Linux has, but it's very advanced. You can do a lot of bad stuff when you're, especially if you're close to a network with one of these. So what can you do with Kali? Um, so if you're beginning to learn hacky, hacking, Kali Linux will let you learn about exploitation, Wi-Fi hacking and scanning, meaning like finding out what's around you and starting to interact with it, programming and writing your own exploits or payloads, uh, you'll be able to follow online tutorials and learn the basics about this sort of stuff. You'll be able to use frameworks like uh, Metasploit, Multego, comes pre-installed. Hmm, this is why we did this today. So if you're having a hard time running Multego, try installing Kali Linux, and it is installed by default. So you should be able to just open it in Kali Linux, and barring some sort of disaster, it should just run. So that's just a suggestion if you're having a hard time doing this otherwise. I wanted to pick Multego because it's a standalone application and it works pretty well on most people's computers. But if it's not, consider just taking the next step anyway and just installing Kali Linux because we're going to be using it anyway. So um, it's also very good at exploring network scanning. So you can, once you're plugged into a network, you can basically own it with the Raspberry Pi and you can run most new security tools easily, provided they don't require a lot of processing power. So for man in the middle and uh, manipulating traffic, that means you're basically putting the Raspberry Pi between the router and all the devices that are trying to connect to the internet. So in this configuration, we plugged directly into the Ethernet, and we've also have a wireless network adapter plugged in. So we have two network adapters, one for controlling the Pi and one for attacking, and then we have access to both the Ethernet and uh, a network adapter that can create a fake network. So what this device does is actually creates a fake network that has the same name as the real network, and it acts like an evil router to sit in the middle and kind of um, either feed them fake pages or try to get them to type in the password. Now, this is called a pumpkin pie. It's actually a specific build meant for the Raspberry Pi learning, uh, using Kali Linux. And there's a lot of specific security tools that are actually based on the Raspberry Pi that will use a certain hardware setup to very elegantly accomplish a function. In this case, attacking a wireless setup. Now, my proof of concept was using this in a co-working space. And when I set this up, I set it to Google Starbucks, even though that was not the name of the co-working space. I didn't want to do a real attack. And the issue was, four people kept connecting to it and would not connect to the real network. And because it was serving relatively fast internet, because it was directly plugged into the net, the uh, ethernet, they just kept using it. So I couldn't run some of my more evil experiments because like people in the building kept joining the network, even though they shouldn't. So these are really effective. As you can see, they're quite small. So if you were using a Raspberry Pi um, Zero, uh, zero the W one of the with a network card you could hide one of these in a very inconspicuous place and take over people's phone connections temporarily if you use the network that they previously connected to like Google Starbucks so just a thought hide this somewhere anybody walking by it that's ever connected to a Starbucks before will briefly connect to it and be vulnerable to whatever you want to do in that small amount of time just an example of how you can use the Raspberry Pi in a real world setting to be discreet, small, and run a, something on the Kali Linux toolkit to accomplish a function that might otherwise be like, how the hell would I even go about doing that? Uh, another one is taking down wireless networks. So this is an experiment I did in the fashion district where I was showing a Raspberry Pi connected to a uh, wireless network adapter could take out either a specific security camera that was attached to a network via Wi-Fi or an entire city blocks worth of wireless networks. So the way it does that is by using the Raspberry Pi to scan um, all the available channels, find devices that are communicating, and add them to a blacklist. And then once every, I think it's actually multiple times every second, it goes through the blacklist and sends a deauthentication request to every single one. 
which means every single device broadcasting in the area is constantly getting bombarded with requests to disconnect from the network, seemingly from the network it's connected to. So by running this concurrently, you can drop in, I think we did this on a, a $30 Raspberry Pi 3B, and you can take out an entire city block's worth of Wi-Fi based on a very, very small package. Now, is this noisy? Yes. Is it a good idea? No. Will you get caught? Probably if you keep doing it. Uh, but it is a really good example of how you can run some advanced frameworks that do some really tricky stuff. Now, I'm talking identifying a security camera, finding it on the network, and even though you're not even part of the network and don't have the password, still being able to knock it off the network and even maybe seize control of it and feed it something different. So uh, that is all very useful for attacking networks, but we can also either anonymize traffic or the reverse, track users. So because we can plug this into the ethernet, we can use it as a, like basically a VPN or Tor router so that any connections going in or out are all anonymized as best as possible. So that means if you were setting up a hacking lab and you wanted to make sure that all your traffic, uh, all your maybe suspicious search requests for finding out why these tools aren't working are going through an, anonymi an anonymized connection. Um, it can do that just by sitting between you and the router in a friendly capacity or it can do it in an evil capacity where it sits nearby and waits to hear when someone comes home and basically like can track people by Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in their phones or laptop devices. So the fact that this has both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi allows it to be a standalone monitoring unit. So if you want to use this for basically espionage, you can very easily configure this to react to certain environmental variables such as a person's cell phone coming home or joining the network. So the amount of automation you can produce on a Raspberry Pi is really mind-blowing if you know what you want to accomplish. So if you want to learn about how exploits work, that means a flaw in a computer system or a program that allows you to gain some sort of foothold or privilege that you're not supposed to have. Now, Metasploit is the most popular way people begin to learn about exploits. It's a framework that allows you to scan find a vulnerability, craft it so it does something, drop something into the computer system you're targeting that's persistent so it can call you back, and then load whatever tools you want to use on the network you're attacking, or on the, on the uh, device you're attacking. So this is kind of what, what people think of when they think of hacking. When we talk about like a zero-day vulnerability, that is an exploit. And what that means is, it's a, is it is a flaw in the way that the, the software is, or firmware or whatever it is is running that allows you to get a predictable but unanticipated result. So if I find something that crashes a, a critical part of the program that would otherwise prevent me from doing something, that is an exploit. And Metasploit is a big framework that's basically a library of all these exploits that people have contributed. So what Metasploit does is allow you to scan a network, find all the devices that are connected, and if you know what the exploit is that affects them, once you identify the device, you can apply the exploit and actually get complete control over the computer. You can do anything. Um, Metasploit also comes with something called Met Metaterpreter. And generally what an attacker would do is once they find a vulnerability in the system, load Metaterpreter uh, onto the host, uh, onto the target system, and then use that to load basically anything else they want to put onto that computer in order to steal things or, or do bad stuff. So Rapid7 is the company that develops Metasploit. They're actually very close to us, and we have talked to them about maybe presenting with us before. So if you're curious about the way this sort of things, the way this sort of stuff works, there's a ton of support around Metasploit, and it's very, very well supported, and it's actually fascinating. So uh, it's definitely the beginner's first uh, like exploitation framework. There are a lot of other ones that work just the same way as this. So if you want to learn how this sort of thing works, there are a lot of advanced tools that attackers use to remotely control computers. They're called RATS or remote access um, programs. And they work very, very similar to this. In general, you'll have a bunch of computers you compromised in a list, a series of instructions you can send them, and a series of responses you've gotten back. So as you task the zombie computers you've taken over, you can either do something as simple as just take over one for the purpose of gathering information, or you can take over a whole army of computers and use them for something like a botnet. So that's kind of the way that uh, exploitation works and why you would want to try using Metasploit on Kali Linux. Um, there are a couple things you can't forget. When you install Kali Linux, you need to change the SSH keys. That means any time, so if you don't know what SSH is, it's the primary text-based way of communicating with a remote computer system. So when you want to communicate via SSH, you'll open a terminal window, type in the IP address and the username of uh, the account you want to access. So if it were my Kali Linux system on a Raspberry Pi, I would find the IP address on the network and then the root account. So it would be root at IP address. Press enter and it will basically ask you for the password. And when you supply it, you will be inside this computer in a terminal command line interface, able to run or execute whatever you want. 
So if you don't change the keys, then you'll be using the same default keys that Kali Linux comes with, and that means they're not encrypted because they're known. So because they don't have any actual entropy and they're not really randomized, anybody can man in the middle your communication and, and basically insert commands, see what you're doing. It basically makes it not private. So SSH stands for secure shell, but you need to make sure it's secure by changing the default passwords on everything. Not just the security keys, but also the default password for almost every distribution of Linux, uh, default username root, default password tor, that is root backwards, that is not good. So you need to change that pretty much as soon as you start out the system because anybody, as soon as you bring this thing in contact with the internet, anybody can log in and most viruses and malware are programmed to exploit default passwords. They just have a list of the most common passwords that the kinds of, kinds of systems they're targeting are using and they will try those first before they even try and exploit because I mean, most people never bother to change it. Now, I also want to impress upon you that you should not just change the default password on this one thing I'm telling you an example of. This should be a way of life. If you have a printer that's on the network, it's running Linux and it has a default password and I can go in and I can see everything you printed if you don't change it. If you're running a router that is also running Linux, it has a default password. It's almost always admin admin. That's not good. I can log in and I can change your network settings. I can change your DNS address so that it loads bad web pages. If I wanted to hack someone, honestly, it's easier to go in and change the settings on the router that they rely on than it is to go and compromise their computer because people will have locked down their computer, but they don't even know that their router has a login page, let alone that they should be changing it. So think and consider when you see some like a smart device, like does this have a, does this have a default password? Because it does. It pretty much, if it's a computerized system, it has a default password. So you need to change that on Kali Linux. You'll need to change it on anything, but get in the, in the mindset of, is this a hard-coded hard password or is this a default password? If it is, change it immediately. Um, if you wanna set this up for remote use, you need to go through a couple processes to make sure that it boots without basically hanging up on the login screen. If you're trying to be sneaky and plug in your Pi and connect on your phone, the last thing you want is it to ask you for your login and password. You have to plug in a keyboard, you can't see anything, you have to type it in, and then it will log in, start Wi-Fi, and start SSH, which allows you to log in. If you don't do that, you will be stuck. So there's a couple things when you're setting up the computer that you'll have to kind of think about if you're using the Raspberry Pi, for example, um, that on a normal computer might not be necessary. So the example I just gave you is specifically for the Pi. If you want to have it in your backpack or your bag and you want to be able to connect to it. But if you were using this on a laptop computer and not on uh, you know, a Raspberry Pi, then that would become less important. Uh, in fact, it would become a security risk to have it automatically log in if it was on your desktop. So the advice I'm giving you is also kind of specific to the application you're planning on using it for. So activating Bluetooth on a Raspberry Pi um, takes a setup script, especially if we're using the Reason kernel. If we're not using the Reason kernel, it's a little bit more of a process, but there's plenty of tutorials. You should use Bluetooth. It's on here. It's fascinating. There's lots of different attack vectors and scanning vectors with Bluetooth. You can connect to other people's stuff and actually pull a surprising amount of information. So I recommend that you check that out as well. And then um, make sure that you always fully up update and upgrade your system the first time uh, you use it and then every time you're going to do anything significant. The reason being packages can become broken as uh, one thing doesn't update. And if you try to run a fancy new tool, it may be using an old version of a library and make it so it doesn't work properly. So if you have errors, um, the first thing you should do before getting frustrated or Googling or anything, run an update. apt get update. That's it. It's easy. And as soon as that's done, if it doesn't fix your problem, then go search for it. But otherwise, if you do it in the reverse order, you can get really frustrated. Uh, so first try to update. If it still doesn't work, then Google. Trust me on this one. I have spent multiple hours searching problems and then found out that I just needed to update because it was using an old library. So if you want to check out, I don't, I needed some clip art. If you, uh, if you want to check out more, uh, you can go to Kali.org and they are, that's the webpage that has a ton of information, including like beginner's guides on Kali Linux. You can go to offensivesecurity.com where they have the actual downloads for that whitehome.au.com. Okay, so I also produce uh, videos for Nullbyte, and we did one on um, the Reason Kernel last week, which now has like 60,000 views, I think. And then some other guy also did a video that also has a ton of views. So that website might be down right now, because I've been pointing a lot of people towards it, and when I tried to go earlier, it was down. But there's other places you can download the Reason Kernel if you're interested. Just know that I've, I've kind of flooded them with traffic by um, talking about them. And then last but not least, we'll put these guides up on hackerinterchange.com. Make sure you guys have access to them. We'll go more into setting up Kali Linux later, but those are the various ways you can run a, kind of like a hacking Linux operating system. The various uh, 
pitfalls of doing so in a virtual machine or dual booting, and kind of my suggestion, which is to just run it on a smaller single board computer so you can just not have to worry about it and use it as a peripheral or companion device rather than your primary operating system. So I think that'll solve a lot of the issues you guys were having running Multego or running any of these specific tools. Doing this is like your initiation. Think of it as a, a, a coming of age thing uh, for hackers. It's like once you figure out how to install Kali Linux, everything, well, I'm not gonna say it gets easier from there, but it gets a lot more simple when it comes to understanding why things are happening. Now getting a good solid uh, installation so you're not dealing with virtualization issues or other distracting problems that detract from your ability to learn about this sort of stuff is really important. So I hope you guys will spend some time on picking one that works for you. It doesn't need to be Kali. Um, Parrot Security OS, as I said, is kind of my favorite. So if you're gonna be using it on a desktop or a laptop situation, consider checking that out. It's just the installation for Parrot on a Raspberry Pi is a mess and I'm not gonna make you guys do it. So that's all I have for you guys for today. Uh, we'll learn more about uh, Kali Linux-based tools throughout the course, and we'll be using, of course, Multego again, which next time I'll get into a little bit more about what you can do, and hopefully uh, you guys will be able to follow along. I just felt a little bit bad because I noticed some of you were struggling last time. So that's it for today, and I'll see you guys next week.